Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Ambassador Barbara Bodine, who is a lecturer at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Uh, she has just recently completed her 30-year distinguished career in the Foreign Service, where in, which included service as uh, U.S. Ambassador to Yemen. Uh, Ambassador Bodine, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in the Midwest. I'm born in Missouri, but I was raised in California. I came here when I was 18 months old, so I'm a Californian in my heart. And looking back, uh, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Um, I think probably in two ways. My stepfather was in the Navy. And so there was a sense of service and a, and a sense that there was an outside world. And my mother was extremely interested in, in politics. But I think the decision to go to the, into the Foreign Service, I really credit with a high school teacher mm -hmm. uh, more than my family. And, and what, what was it that the high school uh, teacher did? Taught you uh, about the world? Or? There was a special class one summer in L.A. City Schools on international relations that I somehow got selected for. And um, it was run like a college class. And one of the things that the professor did was have people from the consulates in Los Angeles come out to talk hmm. to the class. And I was already interested in politics and international relations, but growing up in the west end of the San Fernando Valley, you don't know a lot about the outside world. And I became intrigued that there was this thing called diplomacy where you could go out and do international relations. And a very nice British diplomat sat me down at 16 hmm. and explained to me this wonderful world. And uh, I decided then. So I credit it more with some unknown British diplomat. Mm -hmm. and, and then where did you uh, go and do your undergraduate work and then you were set from what you're saying. You, you knew that you wanted to do international studies there? I, I did. It it's, it's, um, maybe shows a lack of imagination, but I decided when I was 16, and I never changed my mind, I went to UC Santa Barbara. Uh, they had a very fine Asian studies department. I decided I wanted to study China and um, also chose UC Santa Barbara because I wanted to do education abroad. And I was lucky enough to spend my junior year in Hong Kong, which hmm. was a remarkable opportunity. I think probably the most important step I ever took. And why was that? Uh well, I think for one thing it confirmed that I really did like the international world, um, that I loved living abroad, I loved living in other cultures. And I had the opportunity to get to know the American diplomats at our consulate there mm. and find out, you know, what, what kind of people are these and, and what is it that they do. And even though I had been pretty committed before I went to Hong Kong, by the time I left Hong Kong, it was, it was close to an obsession that I was going into the Foreign Service. And, the, and what, did you have any uh, uh, professors at uh, Santa Barbara who, who really influenced you in, in sort of confirming and helping you along in that direction that you already A little had? bit, but not really. I mean, you have to remember that in those days, women didn't go into professions. They right. certainly didn't go into the Foreign Service. I think one professor did, um, was very helpful. When I got back from Hong Kong, he looked at my resume, he looked at what I wanted to do, and he said, you have a wonderful background in everything China. Mm -hmm. You don't know anything about your own government. And so my senior year of college, I sat down and got a degree in American political science. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was excellent advice. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you wind up? We know that you wanted to do this. You mm -hmm. had prepared to do this. But uh, again, this was a, a, a time when uh, not every the, the women were still struggling. Absolutely. To, 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 to move into uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to positions they had not had. So talk, talk a little about your deciding to do the Foreign Service and then what were the obstacles you encountered uh, at, at this time in your life? Well, there, it wasn't easy. And I think in some ways I was very lucky that no one around me knew enough about the Foreign Service to tell me I couldn't do it. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> there's a certain blissfulness to ignorance. Um, I was preparing myself. I 
took the exam when I was an undergraduate and passed both the written and the oral as an undergraduate. But I had been advised by my friends in Hong Kong from the consulate to get a master's and, and, and to really focus my, my studies. And so even though I had passed all the exams, I went to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And I think that that was kind of a, an intellectual finishing school that was terribly useful. Um, ran into, you know, some real resistance there. I had at Fletcher at or Fletcher. Yeah, yeah. At Fletcher. And um, I, um, my, um, my faculty advisor, for example, told me on the first day he met me that he had never met a woman graduate student above the B plus. You know, mm. hello, very nice to meet you, and besides that, you're a, a B student. Um, but there were enough people around who said, no, you know, continue to do this. It wasn't easy in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, the service was only beginning to open up to women. But um, it is, you know, I was single-minded about it and just never really, you know, there was incoming fire, but I just kept going forward. Uh, before <laughs> we pick up your career in a few minutes, what, let's talk about so being a diplomat and, and uh, being in the foreign service, what, 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 are the, what, are the, what does it take to do that? What are the skills involved mm -hmm. in terms of preparation, but, but, but what are the, the, the uh, attributes you have to have to do it well? Yeah, I think it's more attributes than particular skills, and I, I try to dissuade students from thinking that there's a, a set academic course mm -hmm. that you can take. Um, the two primary skills that you need you need to be able to write well. Um, you absolutely need good writing skills, and, and without that, you're not going to be able to do the job. Interestingly, you also need very strong people skills, and I think this is one of the things that distinguishes the Foreign Service and diplomacy, is that you have to be enough of a, if you want, an introvert to be a very good analyst and a very good writer, and enough of an extrovert to be able to deal with a broad range of personalities, um, gather their support, their, their trust, uh, so that they will talk to you. So it's an odd balance between these two. Uh, you, need, you need a passion for the job, and I think the, the diplomats who are the most successful are those for whom this is. It's a deep personal commitment, almost a calling, uh, and a passion. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you have to see the constant moving around, uh, the living in very difficult circumstances, um, the bureaucratic frustrations, to be honest. And if you can't sort of see this as part of the job and something that you're, you're, you're going to enjoy, then you're not going to do it well. And I think for every profession, you have to have a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you know, as someone yeah. said, if you can't look adversity and absurdity particularly absurdity in the face in laugh, mm -hmm. you probably can't do it. On this, this extrovert dimension, I, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it has to link up, I guess, with this uh, analyst dimension. Right. And, but you, and you have to have your ear to the ground, basically. Mm -hmm. Once you're in a setting, be able to, to sort of grapple with very different cultures mm -hmm. and talk to all kinds of people. All yeah. kinds of people, yeah. often people and sometimes people you don't like. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you, you, you touched on an important point. You have to be able to listen. Um, your job as a diplomat is not to go in and, and lecture and, and talk at, but to really listen and listen very hard to, to what you're hearing and why you're hearing it. Um, not just the words, but what's the message. And understand the context in which it is being said. Um, if you just go in and talk to a couple of government ministers and get the, I think Ross Perot many years ago said that we could be replaced by fax machines. Um, <laughs> he would say something. He would say something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and if you think our job is simply to deliver a message and, and get back a canned message, then he would be right. But our job, we're, we're interpreters. And it's not just a word interpretation, it's a cultural, political, what's underneath interpretation. And a good diplomat does not spend their time in their office. They're out, they're around. Um, they're not just talking to government ministers. And so you really have to get into where you are without ever losing sight of the fact that you are representing mm -hmm. your, the United States. 
And so you're not a cultural anthropologist in that sense where your job is only to understand that culture, but to be able to move back and forth between your own and theirs. Mm -hmm. And and you, you have, there must be some aspect of the role that's like a broker, and by that I mean you're finding out what's going on, uh, you, mm -hmm. you, th there might be a tendency to identify very strongly with, with what you right. know is going on the ground, but then this has to go back to ultimately to Washington mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the, the, what your analysis is going to be uh, subject to all the bureaucratic politics that right. is Washington. You are a broker. You're a negotiator, um, not just on a particular issue, but between two cultures and two political systems. You have to be credible enough as the American diplomat with the host government and host society that they know who you're representing and why. Incredible enough with Washington that you understand where you are. If you become an advocate for the host government and the host society, you're probably going to lose um, your credibility in Washington. If you are simply delivering messages from Washington and not listening, you're not going to be very good. So you have to have that ability to move back and forth and be equally credible to both. Never losing sight of who you represent, but understanding what your job is. And yes, sometimes you do also have to go into the host government and say, we don't agree, this doesn't make sense. Um, and I think candor is a particularly important uh, quality. When I went to Yemen, I, uh, I remember my very first meeting with the president there, and I told him openly, up front, that he might not always agree or like what I said, but that I would never lie to him. And um, it's sort of the same thing with Washington. You have to have that credibility. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, you, uh, in your distinguished career, were involved in uh, the, the programs that train foreign service officers. Yes. I don't m remember exactly the role that you had, but, but I'm curious because has the foreign service changed a lot in the course of your career, and ha has what the training has to involve changed? I think in some ways it has. Um, certainly the range of issues that we deal with, uh, the transnational issues, are far more complex. Health, terrorism. Um, AIDS, avian flu, human trafficking, um, human rights, which is now, um, is, is, is now a, an integral part of our diplomacy. But it's, it's a far more complex uh, range of issues. You have to understand economics and development. You have to understand basic security needs. And so the ability to be intellectually adaptive, um, to be able to move from one subject to another, uh, we're generalists, um, but that doesn't mean that you're a dilettante. So you have to really understand how all these different issues fit together. And it's the ability to integrate the range of issues and how do they support, sometimes conflict in our own policy or in the policy of a country. So you, there is that adaptive ability. Um, I've, when I'm teaching, I'm always telling my students that you have to be able to, to analyze, synthesize, and then extrapolate, and, and the same holds true in the Foreign Service. We have to be able to work across the interagency uh, field in Washington as well. You have to know how to work with the military. You have to know how to work with the intelligence mm -hmm. community. And so there's a multifacetedness um, to us, which I think has always been there to a certain extent, but it is certainly much more um, complex now than it was before. You, you started interested in Asia, but, yeah. but, it, but, but the bulk of your uh, uh, career has been in uh, the Arab world and in, in the Gulf states. Right. Uh, tell us how that transition came about and how you adapted to, to the new environment. Mm -hmm. um, my undergraduate and graduate degrees were both in China. Mm -hmm. um, hours and days and months learning to read, read and write Chinese, and that's where I wanted to go. And my first couple of tours were in Asia. Um, I decided with the arrogance that only a 25 or 26 year old can have 
that I was too narrow um, because I had kind of started on China in, in this high school class and thought, you know, I really need to go look at another part of the world and get some perspective or I'm, as I said, I'm going to be far too narrow and ended up with a job working on the Arabian Peninsula. And um, I really did that. It was going to be for two years. It was going to be, a, if you want, an intellectual or a professional sorbet. And mm. I absolutely fell in love with the region. I found it fascinating. Um, the U.S. national security interests there were obviously critical. But it was just, there's something very intriguing about the region and what was supposed to be a two-year diversion ended up being a 30-year career. And um, I never really looked back. Every once in a while I thought about going back to Asia or the Asia Bureau would ask me to come back and I just kind of kept falling back to uh, to the to the Gulf region. Mm -hmm. and, and, and during the course of your career, uh, America's uh, policy toward the Middle East uh, really evolved and uh, uh, some would say uh, not for the good uh, in, in the recent period. But uh, I, I'm struck by uh, some of the very interesting positions you had at, at very mm -hmm. interesting times. So mm -hmm. in, in one case, you were deputy uh, in Kuwait right, uh, right before uh, the first uh, 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 Gulf War. Right. Uh, uh, talk a little about that. I mean, what, because there must have been, here you were <laughs> uh, uh, developing and had developed a notion mm -hmm. about the area and, and suddenly, uh, we, you and the embassy in Kuwait were confronted with a, with a very different uh, situation. Well, I had, before I went to Kuwait, I had served in Iraq for three years and, mm -hmm. and so had some familiarity with Saddam and his regime and had actually been assigned to Kuwait as a, um, as a reward for having worked on the tanker protection regime, which you might remember from the end of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, because Kuwait was supposed to be this nice, quiet, pleasant little place where nothing happened. Mm -hmm. We were there when Saddam invaded, and oddly, I, I count the Gulf War from August 2nd, 1990, not from January 17th, 1991. I, I count it from his invasion. And we were confronted with, it was interesting with what the essence of diplomacy is, because there was, Saddam wanted us to shut our embassies, everyone to shut their embassies. And the ambassador and I um, decided that we really couldn't leave, that we had 3,000 Americans trapped in the city. And while there was safe passage for diplomats out, there was no safe passage for American citizens. And we went back to Washington and said, no, we are going to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and Saddam's regime was threatening us with all sorts of horrible things, and you always took Saddam's threats seriously. But there was a, a very deep commitment within the embassy that we couldn't abandon the Americans. Um, on the more political side, there was a decision that we, we the United States, we the rest of the world, did not recognize the Iraqi annexation of Kuwait. And so to stay with our flag flying mm -hmm. was a way of demonstrating. So it was, it was the, the, the crystallization of, of what we do overseas. Now, in, in an earlier period, and you talked about this yesterday at a seminar at the Institute, mm -hmm. the, the whole question of, of Saddam's signaling about right. what his intentions were, and, and uh, th there was a, an interesting play here between what you were seeing in the course of the buildup right. prior to the war and what was being said and thought in Washington, uh, which kind of is a, mm -hmm. is a revealing, uh, I think, example of what you were talking about earlier, namely mm -hmm. knowing what's going on and, and but having right. to communicate it back to, the, to Washington. Well, for one thing, we were, the, the, the conventional wisdom in Washington was that Saddam was simply rattling his sword, and, and the Iraqis had done this over the decades. We sat down, to be honest, I sat down, uh, and um, analyzed what Iraq had done prior to the invasion of Iran and then what Iraq had been doing for the previous six months. And we came to the conclusion that Saddam was going to invade. Mm -hmm. And we sent a very, what I thought, a very well-written cable off to Washington explaining this. And um, 
Washington's analysis was, no, that this is just saber rattling and we don't need to worry about it. There was, I think a lot of people still hold this belief that our ambassador in Baghdad signaled to Saddam that we didn't, we didn't either care about what he did in, in Kuwait or wouldn't take any action. And to be perfectly honest, that, that's, that's really not a fair analysis of her meeting, and even the Iraqis have admitted that. But we did have an assistant secretary who— In Washington. In Washington, who in a hearing with the House International Relations Committee, chaired at that time by Lee Hamilton, who we all know from the 9-11 report, um, who asked our assistant secretary, you know, do we have a defense mm. agreement understanding anything with Kuwait? And he asked the assistant secretary this three times, and three times the assistant secretary said no, period, and which was not the correct answer. Um, he could have referred to, he should have referred to, and I think someone who understood the region better, understood our history there, understood Saddam better, would have given an answer that would have been no, we don't have a formal agreement. But there is the Carter Doctrine, which is still U.S. policy. And if anyone questions whether or not that policy is real, they would look at the navies of 17 countries coming in to protect international shipping. By just simply saying no, mm -hmm. um, we had an assistant secretary who signaled, I think, if anyone signaled to Saddam that we were walking away from our previous commitment to protect the Gulf. Mm -hmm. One wonders here, because this is a problem that I think you must have encountered over the years, and namely the where our policy changes with regard to actors in a particular region. What I have in mind here mm -hmm. is uh, during the Iran-Iraq War, we're mm -hmm. going back. You know, we we aided, uh, or it's alleged that we aided uh, 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 Saddam in certain ways, providing mm. satellite technology. So what, I, what I'm curious about is, is this a case in Washington of not listening to what they're being told from the ground because the, 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 the Washington is not attuned to the new realities mm -hmm. created after the flip. In other words, for strategic reasons, we supported Saddam right. in that war, but now that situation has changed. What, what, what's going on here, do you think? I think, I think there were a couple of things yeah. going on. Um, we did support Saddam less than some people think, but we did support Saddam, as did all of the Arab states. And that was, that was pure strategic necessity. Um, Saddam was fighting Khomeini's Iran. This was right after the Iranian Revolution, and this was a very radical and revolutionary um, Iran. And he was kind of the bulwark against an Iranian victory. Um, and so this, it wasn't so much that we were looking for an Iraqi victory, but everyone was quite conscious that we couldn't allow an Iraqi defeat. And so it was a 55-45, at, at best, um, balancing. There was a school of thought in the U.S. Uh, that because we had supported Saddam um, and, and kept Iraq from being overrun, that there would be a measure of gratitude. And um, I think a number of us in the region, and this was part of our, our report to Washington, was uh, Saddam is not a grateful personality by nature, and that he is emboldened, he is greedy, and he does not make judgments based on what we would consider rational decisions. Um, and then again, you have to look at what he did before he went into Iran, what he was mm -hmm. preparing to do now. And by his calculation, he had done this buildup on the Iranian revol on the Iranian invasion. We have to remember he invaded Iran first. Um, and the world had let him get away with it. So if I did A and B and got away with C, I could now do A and B and get away with this. The other element of the, the, the construct was the Soviet Union was falling at this time. There were a lot of other mm -hmm. big events happening. And I think Washington was overly focused on these, what they saw as the big events. and. They wanted to hear. There were two competing analyses, sword-rattling invasion. And the sword-rattling analysis was 
more convenient. If we, if we go with this one, then we don't have to act. And I think that they, they were busy, they were distracted, they wanted to hear there wasn't going to be an invasion. And that's why I think our analysis just didn't carry the day. I think the final point is that if they had accepted our analysis that he is going to invade, they then would have had to make some very difficult decisions about what do we do to stop it? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that anybody had thought through how far would we go to stop an invasion? Um, and even the decision to try to reverse it took about a week. Mm -hmm. Let's talk now a little about your later role as ambassador uh, to Yemen mm -hmm. and uh, what uh, yesterday, again in the seminar, you were uh, talking uh, about how one would move forward with the agenda uh, uh, for democratization mm -hmm. in an environment in which everybody in the region is coming to question uh, uh, American policy because of now we're talking about the invasion of Iraq. So, so I'm curious. Uh, I want you to talk a little about the job of ambassador mm -hmm. and how you work in this environment. And let's pick this particular mm -hmm. issue of democratization. How you work with other embassies with different actors in Yemen uh, to move forward uh, the democratization mm. agenda at a time when it's clearly not working in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was, I was in Yemen 97 through 01. Oh, okay. All, all right. All right. So then let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. You're, uh, my, my error. Right. Yeah. So let, let, so, uh, but, uh, what, so let me ask you the question this way then was, was the, the, uh, uh, was it easier to do your work then because mm -hmm. our invasion of Iraq had not happened yet with all the consequences that occurred there? Um, it, it, was, it probably it was easier than it would have been in 93, in, in, I'm sorry, 93, 2003. Mm -hmm. um, but while there has been an enormous, there was enormous popular resistance in the region to, to the Iraq uh, invasion of, of 03. Um, and, and, and still, I think even within the, the governing structures in a lot of these states, there, what you need to, and this is what a diplomat does, um, is that you have to have a, a depth and a complexity to relationships so that one issue doesn't drive the entire process. Um, I do think that the way that the current administration has gone about democratization has probably made it as difficult as what happens in Iraq specifically. It's important to remember that uh, I have trouble with democratization um, um, as, as the term, but that the, the reform and the liberalization effort in much of the Middle East predates Iraq uh, and, in fact, was was fairly well along in the 90s. And you, you take a look at a number of the Gulf states, excluding Saudi Arabia, and you see parliaments, you see elections, you see women's political rights. And so these, these movements are, have a very strong indigenous component to them. And it was more a question of how do you support and encourage rather than, pr to me, promote is us coming in. And supporting and encouraging is finding the indigenous players and finding out what are their priorities, where do they see the best mm -hmm. avenues to move forward, and then figuring out how to help. And there is a little bit of nudging. Um, there are some times when you kind of go in and say, we're not really quite sure about this. We don't, you know, we don't think this is maybe the best way to go. But at the end of the day, it's theirs. And you are going to be much more effective if you if you find out, you know, who are the people you can work with within the government, within civil society, within media, within all of these various players, and then work with them to move it in those areas where they see it as most important and most amenable to reform. And then you sort of take it in a diff, sometimes in a different sequence than mm -hmm. we would. Um, but you kind of keep that going. That has survived. Um, the invasion of Saddam, uh, the invasion of Iraq, but it has the recent, been the recent, the recent one, invasion, yeah. the, the most recent one. Yeah. 
Um, but it it has been damaged, and it's it's been damaged by this sense of that we are exporting an American model, that we are that we have criteria and conditionality, and um, rather than really, as I said, looking at the organic and and the indigenous, and I think in that sense, you have seen a stalling. Uh, we have by our actions in many cases more discredited the reformers than we have assisted them. And and we need to recalibrate, not walk away from, but recalibrate how we do this. And, and what you're, you're, you're suggesting here is that the democratization and transforming the regimes was on the agenda, you know, in the Clinton years. Absolutely. And, and it was being done in a constructive way that sort of reflected the nuances and subtleties of mm. really our changing role in the world because we, we, we're not, we're less and less, even before the Bush administration and into the present, to, to tell people how to do things. Well, I'm not sure that you're ever really in a position to be telling people what to do things. And the minute you start telling them what to do, um, I don't care if it's in your personal life um, or in diplomacy, people will shut down. Uh, our efforts to support democratization, yes, they were they were very strong in, under the Clinton administration, and they actually even predate that. But I think what's important to, to remember about this region is that these efforts and these debates were going on within these countries themselves. This was not a bringing to. Mm -hmm. there's, there's been a, a very vibrant, very dynamic, as yet inconclusive, but still ongoing debate within the region, particularly the Gulf states in Yemen, that they, they recognize that the, the status quo relationship between the government and the governed is not supportable in the long term. They don't want to go back to the 7th or 9th century. They're very skeptical about foreign models, which I think is where we have made a mistake recently. And they're trying to work out what does option D look like. And it's going to be different in Kuwait than it is in Bahrain than it is in, in Yemen. They're going to have different sequencing and priorities. But it's becoming a constructive partner to that debate as opposed to coming in and saying, this is what the debate should look like. This is the order in which you should do things. Um, and that's kind of what we need to go back to is involving as a partner mm -hmm. rather than promoting as an outsider. And, and is uh, the, 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 the negative turn that, th that these issues have taken the result of the militarization of, of our foreign policy yes. uh, in the recent period? Talk about that. How, how does that sort of play out? Because the, the idea in the Bush administration, for example, after mm -hmm. you, know, you, you were no longer in, in Yemen, the idea here is that through uh, military intervention, we right. will transform, and then it will all come into play. Right, right. Well, this this administration has 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 coined, I think, one of the more remarkable phrases, which is "imposed democracy," uh, which is just a fundamental oxymoron. They do believe in this transformational that if you if you wipe the slate clean, that democracy will 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 spring up, um, you know, in uh, spontaneously, and they conflate freedom and democracy. Um, they have not come to terms with the fact they still don't understand, don't seem to be willing to understand, that democracy is something that has to grow up. Um, to say that it's going to take two or three generations, I, I don't particularly like that because people have a tendency to say, well, we'll start in a generation or two. No, you start now and have it grow. The militarization of our foreign policy, particularly in the Persian Gulf, has been damaging, extremely damaging. It puts everything that we do through one prism. Um, we have, in a number of cases, in a number of countries, actually put security and stability ahead of democratization. One of the things that's odd is that the, this administration started off by saying too much emphasis was put in the past on stability and not enough on democracy. So now we're going to go full bore on democracy and we don't care about stability. What they've done is almost go the other direction farther than we've ever gone before. And 
For example, we've put almost no money into democracy support in Pakistan. It's all been, you know, how many of the bad guys can we kill? Mm -hmm. uh, we're still operating on this uh, idea that we are dealing with a military problem and not a political problem or an economic problem. And what's ironic is, you know, Saint Petraeus, um, as he is. <laughs> um, if you really read his counterinsurgency manual, it talks about that the military is only 20 percent of the of the effort. Mm -hmm. um, it's 80 percent politics. It's 80 percent development and diplomacy and governance, and yet we're mm -hmm. still focusing on that 20 percent. Um, and so, in that sense, I think that we have. Someone said we also have this 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 fundamental disconnect where we have people in uniform talking to people about the importance of civilian government. Mm -hmm. uh, we have people who do propaganda getting themselves involved in public diplomacy. And so we send a very odd, mixed signal. And um, I think in that sense, again, our, our friends in the Gulf kind of pull away because we're pushing for a militarized definition of security, stability, and, and friendship that is very one-dimensional. And mm -hmm. I think we have hurt ourselves deeply. To what extent is, is this the result, uh, and, and I guess in, in its extreme form, it is the result of the Bush administration. But on the other hand, it would seem that our financial commitments to the military Four hundred million billion dollar budget now uh, uh, versus the the commitment to diplomacy, which must be thirty or forty billion, so yes. whatever. I mean, I isn't it almost inevitable that this logic would work this way, no matter who was in office? Well, I think at this point, the the imbalance on the resources um, it's always been unbalanced, and and. I, I did some testimony on the Hill recently, and I said that you know the the State Department, the civilian agencies, we're not looking for parity with the defense budget. We are looking for some equity, and the defense budget includes you know aircraft carriers and jet planes mm -hmm. and stuff, and and we don't do that. We just have people, mm -hmm. so we don't. We're not looking for the numbers to end up this way, but there has been. And I think this is is what has happened over the last several years, is the imbalance has grown so sharp that, as someone said at one conference I was at, that you have one agency on steroids and everyone else on life support, and <laughs> and all the resources are there. And so what has happened is that in in normal budgeting process, you define missions. And you then have the resources go to the missions. And the missions follow the agency that has that mandate. So you've got mandate mission resources. What we've got now mm. is resources mission mandate. We've got it reversed. So that the only agency that has the resources is getting the missions. And they're now getting into areas that even the military says, you know, it's not their business. The more this happens, they start to atrophy. Mm -hmm. And they atrophy very badly. You don't you don't have the people to pick up the civilian side. And I think a any new president, well, the new president is going to have to decide if he or she um, you know, wants to continue with this unitary cabinet approach to foreign policy, or do we really want to balance it more? And if they're going to do that, they need to not only move resources back to the civilian side they have to move the missions and mandates. And that's going to take a while to do. Um, a lot of retraining that's going to have to happen, a lot of shifting. I think the military would actually prefer it. I'm not sure that, uh, and I think Secretary Gates understands this better than anybody. He has, given, he has given all the kinds of speeches that you would want the Secretary of State to be giving. Mm -hmm. uh the way this change has come about, obviously as a result of the 9-11 right. attack, but the, the, the important formula here, if we can call it that, was the notion of a war on terrorism. Right. I, I'm curious as to how <laughs> yeah. terrorism 
came on your agenda, and I know we're, I'm talking about the, the span of your career, right. uh, uh, from seeing it as the State Department must have been seeing it as a, as a problem, one Absolutely. of many, many transitional problems, and, and somehow there was a leap over time made mm -hmm. uh, as we began perceiving these attacks right. where it, 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 it it became more significant right. until the point after 9-11 where, where it became the end-all and be-all. Right. Talk, talk a yeah. little about how it came right. on your radar screen. Well, I think terrorism certainly is something that those of us who have lived and worked in the Middle East, we've always been dealing with this. We just had the, I think, the 25th anniversary of the bombing of our embassy in, in Beirut. Um, so this has been an ongoing issue and, and one that the U.S. government's been in, aware of and involved in. I was a coordinator for counterterrorism in the early 90s. And, and as coordinator, that was coordinator of the interagency. That was the military, the intelligence, law enforcement, and diplomacy. And we saw it as an international problem. Um, you know, it was not Islamic terrorism solely or, or mostly. We had, we had the Ba'ath separatists, we had the IRA, we had Sendero Luminiso, that it was an international problem and that we needed international partners, and we also needed a broad range of, of tools from the U.S. government. Um, we very specifically worked to criminalize terrorism, to, to take away their, their hero status and say, no, these are thugs, uh, that, that hijacking is hijacking, murder is murder, kidnapping is kidnapping, and you can't wrap it up in a pretty political package and get away with it. And we were actually very successful. If you look at the, the, the number of terrorist incidents and their lethality up to 9-11, the numbers were going down dramatically. And I think that we really did have the right approach. We saw terrorism as a tool used by thugs for mm -hmm. a political purpose, but we weren't going to give them that, um, that validation. When 9-11 happened, and it was referred to as the war on terrorism, my first thought, this was a rhetorical flourish. It was sort of saying, you know, crime doesn't have the same, the same impact in a, in a headline. The administration did choose to see it as a war, and they explicitly dismissed using intelligence, using law enforcement, using diplomacy as a tool to get at it. As any number of people have said, terror, terrorism and terror are tools. They're not an ideology. It's not a movement. And so you're, we're having a war on a tactic, which makes no sense. Um, I think it has badly distorted our ability to deal with the phenomena. A famous quote from Rumsfeld about, you know, are we killing them faster than, mm -hmm. than the madrasas are producing them? And the answer to that, Mr. Rumsfeld, is we will never be able to kill them faster. You need to get ahead of the curve. And... Um, I think in the State Department, in diplomacy, in the intelligence world, there is an understanding that if we don't deal with this at its roots, we will always be fighting this. And we need to take it away from being a war. We need to take it away from giving the terrorists the political justification and the political status that we've given them. We've heroized them, if I can make up a word here, mm -hmm. in a way that, um, was not necessary, was not smart, uh, and was strategically a blunder. One of the, the, the issues that uh, comes up is the way a, a history is created to justify what we're doing now based on an interpretation of what happened in the past. And, right. And as ambassador to Yemen, you were at the center of, 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 of one of the alleged stories uh, in the sense of how it is interpreted right. about the uh, uh, involvement of the FBI in the, mm. in the coal. Uh, right. the, the coal was based in Yemen. Uh, there was an Al-Qaeda attack. The yes. FBI came. Talk a little about that because there are several things going on. One is it could be that we're distorting the story, but, but secondly, it involves this question of you know, criminal investigation, mm -hmm. moving into the area of, of terrorism as a global right. phenomenon, moving into the area of, of, of your duty and responsibility. 
mm -hmm. uh, as an ambassador right. to, to be sensitive to the uh, uh, to the position of the, the government you're doing without becoming necessarily its its supporter. Yeah, or its advocate. Yeah, um, or, yeah. Yeah, there's there's been a I think a lot of misunderstanding about about what happened after the coal. Uh, the coal was uh, it was a terrorist attack. It was by Al Qaeda. Uh, it was the the first time and and I think so far the last time that we've actually had a boat bomb. Um, and the what happened in the aftermath was um, was less than the story in some ways. It was actually much less than the story in some ways. The real issue that came up in, um, particularly between me and, and, and one senior FBI agent, was not one of um, trying to undermine the investigation or thwart the investigation or becoming an advocate for the Yemenis. It really was, at its very simplest, a chain of command issue. Uh, and, and the gentleman in question, I remember him coming into my office, visibly armed, by the way, Mm -hmm. And announcing, <laughs> and like having a, a large man with a gun walk into your office and say, "Hi, I'm in charge," mm -hmm. um, and I was not armed, um, and explaining to him that no, he was in charge of the investigation. He wasn't in charge of everything that we were doing. And we had, we had, and, and this does really get to the role of an ambassador and, and the role of diplomacy in, in all of this. And as we has been explained is that we really had four missions and and they were very explicit we had them on signs all over the place it was to recover the ship and the crew obviously a critical um, mission uh, protection of the Americans who had come in we had gone from zero Americans in Aden port to 300 the a joint investigation between the Yemenis and and the Americans and the maintenance of the bilateral relationship and the misunderstanding has been that I was somehow focused on the fourth one to the detriment of the other three, or at least the investigation. Only if you see those sequentially, you know, does that make any sense. How it, and my response at the time was, I have three missions and, and, and one specific mandate. Those missions have to move forward simultaneously. We have to recover the ship and the crew, but the way we recover the ship and the crew can't jeopardize the investigation. That's a, it's a crime scene, forensics. At the same time, we can't let the investigation get in the way of the, human, the basic human need to recover those remains. And at the end of the day, if you're not providing protection for everybody, it can't go forward. What I was explaining, and, and I think this, this is, again, the essence of diplomacy, is that the maintenance of the bilateral relationship was the matrix in, within which the rest of this happened. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an end in itself. It wasn't, um, you know, let's do this and make those others wait. If you didn't have the relationship, then you couldn't tackle the problems, the misunderstandings, the obstacles, the resistance, and there, there were problems on all three of those. Those three couldn't move forward if you didn't have this stronger relationship. And a good diplomatic relationship is not one, diplomats, our job is not to make people happy. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not our job. Our job is to have a candid, open relationship that has the strength that when you hit a problem, you can go in and you can have that conversation. And you can say, look, we're getting resistance on cooperation here. I need your help, Mr. President. I need your help, Mr. Prime Minister, that I can go into the head of Yemeni security and say, your president has pledged cooperation, and I'm not getting it. How do we get this fixed? It also means that I have to be able to go into the FBI sometimes and say, what you're asking for is not reasonable. Mm -hmm. or it doesn't make any sense to me, and if it doesn't make any sense to me as to why you want this, I can't explain it to the Yemenis. But that is part of my job. And the other issue, the other debate we had with the FBI was that, look, um, I don't know how to do a criminal investigation. This is before CSI was on TV, so you know none <laughs> of us were amateur forensic scientists. And I said, I'm not telling you how to do your investigation. I can help you understand how to operate in Yemen so that you will be the most effective. If you tell me what your goal is, and I'll help tell you how to get there. If you try to do 
this goal this way, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. But if you do it this way, you're liable to be successful. So let me help you mm -hmm. do your job. Let me manage the government. Let me manage the press so that you can then do your job as the investigator. But that's my job, is to make this thing happen. And that was the disconnect that we never got past, and I want to make the point, with one individual. Mm -hmm. With the rest of the FBI, with the hundreds of agents who came through in the course of the 10 months that I was there, we did have this understanding. We did understand that they had a role, they had a mission, they had tools. My job was to make it work, to intervene and intercede when necessary, to back off when it was useful. But that was, that was the essence of that. Of, As of you it. tell the story, and, and again, we, we're talking about a historical account that has right. been misinterpreted, but it's interesting. It strikes me that part of the problem with making uh, diplomacy as important as it should be is that it, the events of 9-11 and mm -hmm. the history that's created to go back and explain how we right. got there is one where the, the ticking bomb scenario prevails, yeah. namely that, that <clears throat> everything uh, related to these issues has to be perceived as if the country is Jack Bauer you yeah. know, and the bomb is about <laughs> to go off and so on. Right. But, but what the, the thrust of all that you've been saying is that these problems are long term, they mm -hmm. require a multifaceted solution so that you all, obviously you want to be able to do something if there is a ticking bomb, but maybe there isn't a ticking bomb. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, there won't be ticking bombs in the future if you deal with these uh, uh, problems mm -hmm. in a multifaceted uh, way that includes right. diplomacy. You have to have the diplomacy. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I, I can't remember if it was the commandant of, of, of West Point Military Academy or somebody from the chief of staff of the Army who actually got on a plane and went to Hollywood and, and asked the producers of, um, of 24 to stop glorifying torture mm -hmm. um, and that the ticking bomb scenario was, was a highly remote um, um, scenario, that if you really were going to get at the ticking bomb, you needed intelligence services, mm -hmm. you needed good law enforcement, um, you needed good diplomacy to either keep the situation from happening or deal with it afterward. Um, and that if you just focused on you know, the, the Jack Bauer approach, you were never gonna get ahead of the problem. In fact, you probably weren't even gonna get ahead of the ticking bomb. Um, you, we have to understand it's kind of as a as a parallel, um, if you have a a spike in crime in a neighborhood in in, in the United States, yes, you need uh, SWAT teams to go in and take down a crack house. You need to increase maybe the number of patrolmen on the street. You need to get the bad guys off the street corner. Absolutely. If you just stop at that, you're going to be doing that forever. You also need to go in and find out why has the crime spiked? Why are you not getting cooperation from the local citizens? Why won't anyone cooperate with you? How do you then walk it back so that you're not just getting this year's bad guys off the street, but you're keeping that next generation from coming out of junior high and high school and becoming the next generation of gang leaders? So that's the parallel that I would put on it. Mm -hmm. uh what do you think will be the long-term consequences uh, for the Foreign Service of this recent period of, of U.S. foreign policy? What is your greatest concern about the Foreign Service now? And then how do you see us moving beyond mm -hmm. your concerns and, and dealing with the problems you're raising? A concern that, that, that I have and a, and a number of my colleagues of, of my generation um, who do remember when diplomacy was um, an equal arrow in the quiver, um, where this balance of, of, of interagency players worked and where the interagency decision-making process worked. And it has been um, perverted and subverted very badly in the last seven years. We know how it used to work and that it can work, imperfectly, but it worked. I think our concern is that you now have a generation of diplomats and military officers and others, but talk about diplomats, who really don't remember how it can be. You know, mm -hmm. if we've had eight years 
And so we now have officers who are almost mid-rank, who have been in the service as long as I was when I went to Baghdad as the Deputy Chief of Mission, who don't know anything else. And um, there's a concern that new president, new secretary of state, reaffirmation of the role of diplomacy, all of these things happen that I'm talking about, and that diplomats don't know how to pick it up, mm -hmm. that we've lost the ability to lead. We've, we've stopped thinking of ourselves as, as the formulators and implementers of foreign policy, and we've lost the concept of foreign policy as this broad range of issues. And um, part of this is going to be a retraining process. Um, we need to remember who we are, and we, we need a Secretary of State who is clearly the President's chief advisor. Uh, we need an interagency process that is open and transparent. And then we need to remind and retrain and relearn our diplomats on what their role is. Uh, there's a, you, you were asking me at the beginning what were some of the core competencies. Mm -hmm. And one of them is risk taking. One of them is, is the, the ability and the willingness to make hard decisions, um, to make a decision knowing that somebody's not going to like it, uh, and being able to hold to it. And that doesn't mean being a little dictator, but it does mean at the end of the day that the ambassador is the decider. Uh, the Foreign Service is the ultimate foreign mm -hmm. policy formulator. And being willing and able and knowing that you have the backing to make the hard decisions when you need to make them, um, that mistakes have to be, you have to be accountable for mistakes, but that you won't be sacrificed for making an unpopular decision. Mm -hmm. One final question uh, requiring a brief answer. How, hmm. if, if students were to watch this program, how would, you advise them to prepare themselves if, if they see diplomacy as something that mm -hmm. they want to do? I, a couple of things. Um, I'm a huge believer in history. Um, you need to have history. If you, if you walk in that this is ground zero, know your history, love history. Love, you know, read as much history as you can constantly. Um, Languages are important, but you have to have something to say in the language. It isn't a skill. Mm -hmm. It's not an end in itself. It's a tool. Um, travel and live abroad before you come into the Foreign Service. Be sure this is an environment that you're comfortable with. A little humility, a little sense of humor. Um, but I would say that, you know, know your own country, be comfortable with other cultures, travel around. Uh, I gave a commencement address once at a school in Southern California where I told all the students to go out and get dirty. Their parents were horrified, <laughs> absolutely horrified. But I said, you not know. Not your room, you said. Not your room, yeah, clean up your room. Um, but go out into the world and get out of your bubble. Um, and, and get out of your bubble and see if you're comfortable outside that bubble. Uh, test yourself, you know, challenge yourself. Um, don't be reckless, but, but be risk-taking. And, you know, if, if that's what you end up liking to do, then, 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 then do it with, with all the passion that you can muster. Well, on that note, uh, Ambassador Rodin, thank you very much uh, for being here it's today. It's been a pleasure. And sharing uh, these thoughts about your career and the experiences that you've had. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.